inspired lecture, and I'm really quite thrilled that we have such Ollie here to, to speak to us today. And I can tell there are lots of other people who are here for that reason, because they also know this is going to be a real treat. Um, I, I was asked to uh, introduce Sut, I think in part because we were classmates, and I've known Sut for a very, very long time, but also because we both knew Dallas Smythe. And so um, Martin thought that it would be appropriate for me to say a few words about Dallas as well. And it's so easy to talk about Dallas in connection with Sut, because Sut, uh, uh, like myself, was one of those people who liked to debate with Dallas. And uh, one of the things I really want to point out about Dallas Smythe is that he was the kind of professor who greatly enjoyed engaging with his students. And uh, even after he retired, he really wanted to have that connection. And he would come back as a sessional instructor even and teach courses just to be able to have that contact with uh, the students. And I think it's really important to understand that he didn't do that just for the fun of it. He really listened. Uh, it was quite interesting. I would, I, uh, my own background is that I'm a China scholar, and Dallas had traveled to China and was quite fascinated by China and very worried about China. And uh, he opened up a whole debate with an article called uh, After Bicycles What? that um, <coughs> Professor Yedra Zhao and I are still toying with trying to, to answer Dallas even, you know, in, and really try to point out that at the time, we didn't appreciate it, but Dallas was right. He saw things that we couldn't see at the time. We engaged in all kinds of debates with him and later came to see with hindsight uh, just how much wisdom there, were, there was in the questions he was asking. I remember being, my first experience as a teaching assistant, as a graduate student in the School of Communication, was as a TA for Dallas Smythe, uh, together with Rohan Samarajiwa, who has now gone on and, and became a professor himself. And I remember that Dallas was trying to make an argument that the work of consumers in making decisions about what to buy should be viewed as labor. And we were very, uh, uh, Rohan and I were very distressed by this collapsing of production and consumption in one, uh, in one activity. And, ke and kept trying to argue with Dallas about it and tell him that we found it impossible to to ram this home with the students and this sort of thing, and they were resisting this idea and that we were uncomfortable with it as well. And he welcomed that, that uh, um, diversity of opinions, and he kept urging us, he said, tell the students they don't have to give me back the party line, they just have to show that they understood what I was trying to say. And then engage with me, debate with me, disagree with me, I welcome the, the the uh, diversity of, of perspectives. And don't you dare mark them down for disagreeing with me. And I learned from that, and it is, for me, has been a principle all my, all my own academic life, to protect students who want to have a different perspective, who want to argue with the professor. I myself am a, a person who, went, who got a master's degree in political science and flunked poli-sci 100 because I told the professor what was the anticipated answers on the exam and why I disagreed with every one of them. He failed me for it. And it was Dallas who taught me that it was extremely, extremely important to protect those alternative perspectives. And we, all of us engaged with him. The graduate students were, there was a lot of exchange with him. And I remember Sut was one of the key people who was engaging with him over his uh, blind spot analysis. And it really helped to move Dallas forward as well to have that debate. And he had enough wisdom to recognize that, yes, graduate students can have insights. Graduate students can contribute to the development of a theory. They're not just lowly students. And I'm very, very happy that the graduate students have been so active about organizing around Sut coming, because Sut is also one of those professors who is more than happy to engage with graduate students. And I believe that he probably also had learned that from, from Dallas and is carrying on that tradition. And so I want to make sure that people know about tomorrow, that there is going to be uh, further di opportunities for, uh, for discussion. Uh, this today is just the beginning. Uh, poor Seth, he's only here for a couple of days, and we're just running him ragged. And I apologize for that, but it was just too great an opportunity. I can understand why the graduate students want to do this. And, uh, and I'm very, very happy to see that the tradition of graduate students organizing this kind of intellectual exchange and and uh, academic debate is still alive and well as it was in the days when Sutton and I were grad students. 
Uh, with that, I forgot to bring up my notes on my onset's background. He's a professor <laughs> at Amherst, uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, he's the uh, director of the Media Foundation, the Patient Foundation. He's produced a whole set of fabulous videos. No doubt many of you have seen them, um, both in school but also in the Instructional Media Center, because they can be used in other departments as well. And, uh, and I want to get out of here, so he's got the maximum time. We're scheduled to be here until about 6. Uh, so it tells me he's going to speak for about, a, uh, about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, and then throw it open so we can have a good discussion. Okay, with that, I give you a time. Thank you, Pat. Um, it is a genuinely real pleasure to be here. Can people hear me at the back? I'm going to figure out how, I need to, how much I need to project. Uh, it really is good to be here. It's been a while since uh, I was back at SFU in uh, the School of Communication. It used to be a department in my day, um, but it very much has the feel of coming back home. Uh, my time spent here in the early 1980s, seems a long time ago as a, as a graduate student, is an indelible part of my intellectual and political development. Uh, and looking out into the audience today, I see mentors, colleagues, and close friends. So it actually really is good to be, to be back. Uh, I'm especially pleased to be delivering the commemorative Dallas Smythe Lecture, whom, while not someone I formally studied with, I actually never took a class with Dallas, but we had lots of, <laughs> lots of other debates, while someone who I didn't formally study with still played a very large part in generating what has turned out to be a lifelong interest in the study of the institution of advertising. Uh, he was the person who originally drew me to SFU, although he left for Australia before I came, uh, before I arrived, uh, and who gave some shape to what I consider to be my first real venture into the arena of academic research. His classic Blind Spot article and the book Dependency Road both inspired and challenged me to engage in my first project of original theorizing. As, again, Pat mentioned, it was around the watching as working argument, which seemed to be so outrageous. Dallas has claimed that when people are watching TV, they are, in fact, engaged in work. And he meant that literally. He, it wasn't a metaphor. He meant that literally. And some of my early work was around that unbelievably outrageous contention, which I think is true. Um, one of the results of this was my work with Bill Levant, who unfortunately I thought was going to be here today, but has not been able to, to come from from Victoria, uh, was on the theory of watching as working. And I'd just like to read from our acknowledgments uh, when that uh, article was first published in 1986, our acknowledgments to, to Dallas. We wrote, quote, we wish to express our deep indebtedness to Dallas Smythe. His work is a starting point for our own. How, however much our work has, tra has traveled from the start, we have never forgotten his insistence on the productive material activity of audiences. Dallas was and is a materialist in the jungle paradise of idealism. Smythe's original insistence was to point, point out that while the predominant Marxist, tradi Marxist tradition at that time treated the media first and foremost as ideological and cultural institutions, the proper starting point should be an analysis of their economic foundations and especially the role they play in the marketing and consumption of commodities in the broader system of global capitalism. In this, I believe he was absolutely correct and indeed would argue that the media history of the last 25 years has done nothing but borne out his contention. Now, this is not to say that the ideological and cultural role of the media is unimportant. Indeed, it's precisely those functions that draw us to an analysis of media as opposed to, say, the shoe industry. But it is to recognize the importance of starting points and where we know that where we start will determine where we will end up. And I think I'm going to end up in a very different place than, than with, where I started with Dallas, uh, but starting points are, insistent, are, are important. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to give a talk that is broadly in the spirit of Dallas Smythe and his insistence on the correct starting point. And I hope, you can, I, can, I can't guarantee, <laughs> I hope he would broadly approve of the talk that I'm going to give. In my remarks today, I wish to make a relatively modest claim. 
20th century advertising is the most powerful and sustained system of propaganda in human history and its cumulative effect, cultural and political, unless quickly checked, will be responsible for destroying the world as we know it. In the process of achieving this, the masters of the advertising system, global corporations bent on nothing but private profit, will be responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, of non-Western peoples. In addition, the peoples of the world will be prevented from achieving true happiness. Simply stated, our survival as a species is dependent upon minimizing the threat from advertising and the commercial culture that has spawned it. As I said, it's a modest, it's a modest claim. <laughs> I'm, starting, I'm stating my claims boldly at the outset so there can be no doubt, no doubt as to what is at stake in our debates as we enter the new millennium. Now in making this claim, I am in fact departing from what has been the main focus of critical media analysis, which has predominantly looked at examining the areas of news or the movies or TV programs or the press. Now, I don't want to say that these are unimportant, but I do want to emphasize what has not only been neglected, but what I believe is the most powerful cultural and ideological institution in the society. Moreover, while the issue of ownership is, of course, very important, I want to draw attention to what may be even more important, and that is the related issue of commercialization. That is, you know, if, if tomorrow Rupert Murdoch was forced to break up News International, would it make any real difference if, in fact, the underlying logic on which News International is based did not change? I don't, and that, that underly, underlying logic is a commercial logic based around maximizing audiences. So I want to point, ownership, yes, is important. But I want to point to what I think actually has been neglected in the critical tradition. What is the basis of my outrageous claims? Uh, initially, I would just point out the incredible presence that advertising has advertising and commercial messages have in our culture. Ads are everywhere and colonizing more spaces by the hour. And I use the term colonizing deliberately. Colonizing is about taking over, invading, pushing out what was there before. Ads are colonizing, commercial speech is colonizing our culture, as I said, by the minute as we speak. For instance, almost the entire media system, television and print, have been developed as a delivery system for marketers. The function of television and, and, and radio and print is to produce audiences for sale to advertisers. Both the advertisements it carries as well as the editorial matter that supports it acts as a support for the consumer society. That was, I think, one of Dallas's one, initial insights as to what we must, why we have to pay attention to advertising and why it's central to, to this system. The movie system at one time thought to be outside the direct influence of the broader marketing system is now fully integrated into it through the strategies of licensing, tie-ins, and product placements. The major function of many Hollywood films today is to aid in the selling of lots and lots of commodities. As public funds are drained from the non-commercial cultural sector, art galleries, museums, and symphonies bid for corporate sponsorship. Even those institutions thought to be outside of the market are being sucked in. And I bring word from the, uh, the heart, from the belly of the beast, where commercialization is at its, at its greatest. Uh, in, in, Amer in the United States, high schools now sell the sides of their buses, the spaces of their hallways, and the imaginations of their students to hawkers of candy bars, soft drinks, and jeans. In New York City, sponsors are being sought for public play playgrounds. In the contemporary world, everything is sponsored by someone. The latest plans of a company called Space Marketing Incorporated call for rockets to deliver mile-wide mylar billboards to compete with the sun and the moon for the attention of the Earth's population. Actually, my favorite example of the spread of commercials is, um, is in boxing. Um, a f uh, about a year ago, 18 months or so ago, Mike Tyson, you know, the well-known rapist, convicted rapist, was fighting in, um, in Scotland. And it was one of these fights where he was, you know, he was fighting a no-hoper, and it was, the only point of it was to get some, generate some publicity for Mike Tyson. Um, now, if you're the manager of his opponent, and you know you don't have a chance, <laughs> and you know your function is essentially to get knocked out fairly quickly, 
where would you sell space on your boxer's body? Soles of the shoes. <laughs> there were ads on the soles of the shoes of Mike Tyson. You're going to be knocked off your feet quickly. That's, you know, what, what, what else is the camera going to look at? With advertising messages on everything from fruit on supermarket shelves. Try, in the States, try and buy a piece of fruit without something being stuck on it. It's almost impossible. To urinals, you have a captive audience in public bathrooms. And in fact, there is an ad agency that does nothing but place ads in public washrooms. It is one of the, it, it is, you don't get particularly high class products advertising there. Because <laughs> not everyone wants to be in public washrooms. But there is, some products want to be there. Um, to literally the space beneath our feet. Uh, the Bamboo Lingerie Company conducted a spray paint campaign, pavement campaign, in Manhattan telling consumers, this is spray painted on the, on the floor, telling consumers, from here, it looks like you could use some new underwear. With ads spreading everywhere, it should not be surprising that many commentators now identify the realm of culture as simply an adjunct to the system of production and consumption. That, I believe, was Dallas Smythe's great insight when it came to communication and what he wanted to stress. Now, none of this, of course, would have surprised Marx because he recognized what was the essential feature of the capitalist revolution when, in the op very opening lines of Capital, he writes, I've always been struck by what the opening lines of Capital refer to. And I'm, I'm, indebted, I'm indebted to Bill Lease, actually, for this insight. This is Marx talking about, this is the opening lines of Capital. Volume 1, he says, quote, The wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails appears as an immense collection of commodities. That is what Marx points to when he's looking at capitalism and he's, and he's seeing what is different about the appearance of capitalism. What he points to is the number of things, the amount of stuff that capitalism is able to produce. In initially seeking to distinguish his object of analysis from preceding societies, Marx refers to the way the society showed itself, the way the society appears on a surface level, and highlighted a quantitative dimension, the number of objects that humans interacted with in everyday life. And Marx looked at that and saw that as revolutionary. Indeed, no other society in history has been able to match the immense productive output of industrial capitalism. That, that, is the, that is the capitalist revolution. It's the revolution in the sphere of production. This fact features the, colors the way in which the society presents itself, the way in which it appears. Objects are everywhere in capitalism. In this sense, capitalism is truly a revolutionary society, dramatically altering the very landscape of social life in a way no other form of social organization had been able to achieve in such a short period of time. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels, of course, would coin the famous phrase, all that is solid melts into air, to highlight capitalism's unique dynamism. And in fact, it's sometimes difficult when you're reading the Communist Manifesto to figure out if Marx and Engels are critiquing capitalism or if they're in love with it. Because they are in love with its dynamism, which they saw as a prerequisite to wiping away the oppressions of feudalism and for being the prerequisite for the freedoms of socialism that would follow. So it is this quantitative dimension that strikes Marx as distinctive as he, observed, as he observed 19th century London. The starting point of his own analysis, therefore, is not what he believes is the dominating agent of the society, capital. It's called capitalism for a, for a good reason. It's not the agent that he believes creates the value and the wealth, labor. Instead, it is the commodity. That's the, remember, the opening the lines I gave you are from the very first lines of capital. The way capitalism is distinguished is just by the immense collection of commodities. From this surface appearance, Marx then proceeds to peel away the outer skin of the society and to penetrate to the underlying essence, the underlying structure that lies in the hidden abode of production. But he starts off with the way the society appears and then through the brilliant, brilliant focus of analysis, peels away the layers that prevent us from seeing the essential structure. But he starts, as I said, with the commodity. Now, it is not only enough, of course, to produce the immense collection of commodities. Marx has a great, it's a great phrase. I, I use it as often as I can, right? as a, the, the immense collection of commodities. In fact, Ma that's, he, that's what he says in the first lines of Capital. And in fact, there are, quote, there are quotation marks around the immense collection of commodities because he's quoting himself from something he wrote before that he, think, that he thinks this is so central. 
It's not enough only, of course, to produce the immense collection of commodities. They must also be sold so that further investment in production is feasible. Once produced, commodities must go through the circuit of distribution, exchange, and consumption so that profit can be returned to the owners of capital and value can be realized again in a money form. If the circuit is not completed, the system would collapse into stagnation and depression. If you can't sell what you have produced, if you can't sell what you have produced, there will be nothing but stagnation and depression. Capitalism, therefore, has to ensure the sale of commodities on pain of death. It's not a little option to be nice to sell this stuff. On pain of death, the system has to be able to sell what it has produced. In that sense, the problem of capitalism is not mass production, which has been solved, but is instead the problem of consumption. The problem of consumption. So central is consumption to its survival and growth that at the end of the 19th century, industrial capitalism invents a unique new institution, the advertising industry, to ensure that the immense collection of commodities are converted back into a money form, to ensure that what is produced can be sold. The function of this new industry would be to recruit the best creative talent of the society. And I still believe that is where the best creative talent of the society is. It's not in Hollywood. They're not writing the great novel. Uh, they are on Madison Avenue figuring out how to sell us stuff. Its function would be to recruit the best creative talent in society and to create a culture in which desire and identity would be fused with commodities to make the dead world of things come alive with human and social possibilities, what Marx would prophetically call the fetishism of commodities. And indeed, I believe there has never been a propaganda effort to match the effort of advertising in the 20th century and now as we start the 21st century. More thought, effort, creativity, time, and attention to detail has gone into the selling of the immense collection of commodities than any other campaign in human history to change public consciousness. One indication of this is simply the amount of money that has been, that has been exponentially expended on this effort. Today, in the United States alone, over $200 billion a year is spent to sell us things. Oh, that, and that is just the advertising industry. That doesn't count everything that goes into the programs and into the movies and, and what the public relations industry is doing. That's simply just the ad, just, just, the, just the advertising industry. Uh, that is over, four, uh, looked at globally, it is over $400 billion a year. This concentration of effort, I believe, is historically unprecedented. I think the only thing that you could argue could, could, would, uh, could compete with this may be religion over the centuries in terms of any kind of alternative and any kind of uh, focused uh, campaign to change public consciousness. Moreover, these ad messages are not like any other message. The ad messages we see on TV are not like the programs. More care and resources are poured into the, into the creation of the commercial messages than into the surrounding programming. That's why the best things on television are ads because there's more money and resources that, are, that go into them and go into thinking about them. Greater care, there's more, much greater care than the surrounding editorial matter designed to capture the atten attention of the audience. Indeed, if we wanted to compare national television commercials to something equivalent, if you want to know how much money goes into, into national television commercials, um, uh, the thing to compare them to would be the biggest budget movie blockbusters. It would be movies like Star Wars and Jurassic Park. And in fact, second by second, it costs more to make, 30 second, uh, make, to make commercials than it does to make these big Hollywood blockbusters. And there, we, there's a lot of focus on these big Hollywood blockbusters that come out every, every summer. We, you know, we talk about how much money has gone into them. And, well, that is the amount of effort that goes into the stuff that we don't pay attention to, that permeates, that surrounds us, that has seeped into every nook and cranny of the society. If Marx were writing today, I believe that actually he'd start capitalism. He'd start capital differently. I believe that he would be struck by the presence of even more objects, but also much more by the ever-present discourse through and about objects. It's the phrase that Steve Klein and, and, I, and myself and Bill Lees came up with to describe advertising advertising's function, a discourse through and about objects that permeates the spaces of our public and private domains. 
I don't think it's exactly the same thing, but I think this is what uh, Guy Debord was pointing to when in the Society of the Spectacle he wrote, and when Debord writes Society of the Spectacle, these are the opening lines of that. He says, the whole life of those societies in which modern conditions of production prevail presents itself as an immense accumulation of spectacles. All that was directly lived has become mere representation. I'm not too sure it's exactly the same thing, but I think Marx actually would broadly approve of that starting point. From a diamond is forever, an advertising slogan composed on Madison Avenue in 1947 to, to persuade people to buy worthless stones. Diamonds are worthless if, if you measure them from the, from the viewpoint of supply and demand. Right? They, they, the beers that digs them out by the ton in, in South Africa. The, the trick on diamonds has been to, to restrict supply to the market and then to convince us that somehow these things, these worthless things that they, can, they have in abundance, are connected to issues of love and engagement. In that sense, they, the, the diamond is forever to the extent that, every, to the extent that you know, 99% of engagements end up with diamond rings on their fingers. <laughs> that is the most successful campaign in human history to turn something worthless into something we're supposed to spend two months of our, of our annual salary on. I worked this out the other day uh, in, in the United States. So the average size is about $6,000 is what you're supposed to hand over to De Beers for these worthless things. From a, from a diamond is forever to a world where more kids recognize Joe Camel, that's a few years ago, and Ronald McDonald than Mickey Mouse and Santa Claus, and where the golden arches are more recognizable than the Christian cross. This commercial culture is the ground on which we live, the space in which we learn to think, the lens through which we come to understand the world that surrounds us. In seeking to understand where we are headed as a society, an analysis of this commercial environment is essential. And I would argue any critical theory of modern capitalism and its cultural system or any alternative or progressive social movement that does not place the analysis of the advertising system at its center is destined to remain impotent and marginal. That was what Smythe identified and why he spoke so powerfully and so passionately about the blind spot and why it mattered that we looked at things in the correct way. Why we started off in the correct place. Now, seeking this understanding of how advertising works, seeking this understanding will involve clarifying what we mean by the power and effectiveness of ads. And now we need to move beyond Dallas's invaluable starting point. We need to clarify what, when, I, when we talk about the power of the system, how do we understand its power? And we have to be able to pose the right question. For too long, debate has been concentrated, I think, on the wrong question, around the issue of whether ad campaigns create demand for a particular product. Does a beer commercial, does, does Labatt's uh, campaign lead to more sales of Labatt's? Now, if you're Labatt's, or if you are Molson's, or if you are Pepsi, or Ford, or Anheuser-Busch, then that is an important question. That's the right question for you, because you are concerned about the effectiveness of your investment in advertising. However, just because it's the right question for advertisers does not make it the right question for social analysts. And for too long, I think, we have allowed people who have no interest in the social power of advertising to define the question, to define what we should be asking. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in the social and cultural power of advertising, the impact of advertising as a whole on society, that is the wrong question. The right question would ask about the cultural role of advertising, not its narrow marketing role. Culture is the place and space where a society tells stories about itself, where values are articulated and expressed, where notions of good and evil, of morality and immorality are defined. And in our culture, it is the stories of advertising that dominates the spaces that mediate this function. If human beings are essentially a storytelling species, and I believe we are, I believe our desire to communicate and to communicate creatively is is key to our existence, uh, to, to our, to our uh, existence as, uh, as, a, as a species, then to study advertising is to examine the central storytelling mechanism of our society. The correct question then, from this perspective, is not whether particular ads sell the products they're hawking, but what are the consistent stories, what are the consistent stories that advertising spins as a whole about what is important in the world? What are the consistent stories that it spins about how to behave, about what is good and bad? Indeed, it is to ask the question of values. The 
question of values that advertising consistently pushes. And what I want to do in the talk today is talk about what those values are that are pushed into every nook and cranny in the culture, that are pushed into our children's consciousness from the very moment that they can start to think that there is a world beyond them. And what the impact of the what the impact of the colonization of those values may be on our future. Now, there are, there are many stories. Like We could spend a long time uh, looking at these stories. There are many stories that advertising tells. And I just want to examine the three most relevant to us today. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Just I know it's, um, it's going to be a while before I get there. I'm going to do these stories, uh, what, what the major stories are, what their possible impact could be. And then I never, st I, these days, um, I never give a talk without also talking about how do we go about acting on our analysis? How do we build in <laughs> activism into our analysis? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend the last 15 minutes or so talking about uh, what we can do, uh, especially in terms of the strategies of what we can do. So the three, the three most uh, important stories. The first one concerns how we think about and define society. A culture dominated by commercial messages that tells individuals the way to happiness is through consuming objects, I'll come to that in a second, bought in the marketplace, gives a very particular answer to the question of what is society? What is it that binds us together in some kind of collective way? What interests or concerns do we share? In fact, Margaret Thatcher, the former conservative British Prime Minister, gave the most succinct answer to this question from the viewpoint of the market and from advertising. In perhaps her most famous or I think most infamous quote, she announced, and she was not misquoted when she said this, <laughs> people said, oh, she must, be, she must have meant something else. She, was, she meant this. Margaret Thatcher said, there is no such thing as society. There are just individuals and their families. That is, there is, according to Mrs. Thatcher, there is nothing solid we can call society. No group values, no collective interests. Society is just a bunch of individuals acting on their own. And if they act on their own through the marketplace, and if everyone acts on the basis of individual greed, then the marketplace will mediate those relationships. The marketplace is an institution of greed. To the extent that it is based on self-interest, it is an institution that is built, is predicated on human greed. Advertising talks to us not as members of society, Advertising talks to us as individuals. It doesn't talk to us as collectives. It talks to us, addresses us in terms of our individual identities. It talks about our individual needs and desires. It does not talk about those things that we have to negotiate collectively, such as poverty, such as healthcare, such as housing and the homeless, such as the environment. It's not what advertising, it, to the extent that advertising talks about that, it's because it wants to sell us something. And I'll come back to what it's forced to talk about in a second. The market, and advertising is the propaganda voice of the market, the market appeals to the worst in us. Greed, selfishness, and discourages what is the best about us. Compassion, caring, and generosity. That is our central institution, our central allocative institution in society is built on, set on individual interest and on individual greed. Again, this should not surprise us. In those societies where the marketplace dominates, then what will be stressed is what the marketplace can deliver. And advertising, as I said, is the main voice of the marketplace. So discussions of collective issues are, pu are pushed to the margins of the culture. They're not there in the se in center of the main system of communication that exists in the society. I don't think it is any accident that politically, the market vision associated with neoconservatism has come to dominate at exactly that time when advertising has been pushing the same values into every available space in the culture. I don't think that's a coincidence. The neoliberalism and neoconservatism as, a, as, a, as, a, as an ideology has been successful politically as, in fact, the advertising system pushing those very same values has spread into every nook and cranny of the culture. The widespread disillusionment with government I mean, in, in the United States, and I believe here these days, government is a dirty word. Now, government, as far as I, at the moment, is the only way I know, the only institution that exists at the present time that allows us to think in a collective manner. But that idea that government is somehow connected with them, 
that was Margaret Thatcher's great genius. She somehow, she divided up who was us and them. <laughs> and suddenly government was them and not us. And therefore the government was, government was the enemy rather than the collective institution that deals with, with social needs. Now, I know, you know in the United States, government has been bought over and it's got nothing to do. <laughs> but we're talking in, a, in an ideal world and, and what the government formally should be and what democracy formally could deliver. Uh, the widespread disillusion with government has found extremely fertile ground in the fields of commercial culture. Unfortunately, we are now in a situation, both globally and domestically, where solutions to pressing nuclear and environmental problems will have to take a collective form. The marketplace cannot deal with the problems that face us at the turn of the millennium. For, for instance, it cannot deal with the threat of nuclear extermination that is still with us in the post-Cold War age. It cannot deal with global warming. It cannot deal with the erosion of the ozone layer or the depletion of our non-renewable -re resources. Indeed, it can't deal with the so-called problem of terrorism. The marketplace is not an institution that can, that can deal with what is, what is uh, central to our collective existence. The effects of the way we do business are no longer localized. They are now global. And we will have to have international and collective ways of dealing with them. Individual action will no longer be enough. As the environmentalist slogan puts it, we all live downstream now. In that sense, advertising systematically relegates discussion of key societal issues to the peripheries of the culture and talks instead in powerful ways with huge amounts of resources and with incredible amounts of creativity, talks in powerful ways of individual desire, of individual fantasy, of individual pleasure and comfort. There is little discussion of collective issues. The second set of stories that advertising talks about, the second set of values that advertising pushes, concern happiness. And I mean happiness in a, in a, as a subjective, in a subjective form, what individuals can feel. Now, every society has to tell a story about human happiness, about how individuals can satisfy themselves and feel both subjectively and objectively good. Every society has to do that. We, how, do you, how do you make people happy? What is, the, what is the activities that we have to do so that the most amount of people can remain, can become the most happy. So I'm being very crass, but I think that's the basis of almost all political philosophies. And that's not a bad, that's not a bad philosophy actually. It's about human, about, about human interests and about human happiness. Uh, the, the cultural system of advertising gives a very specific answer to that question. That is, how do we become happy for our society? The way to happiness and satisfaction, of course, is through the consumption of objects through the marketplace. Commodities will make us happy. In one very important sense, that is the consistent and explicit message of every single message within the system of market communication. That is what every single message is, is communicating, implicitly or explicitly. Now, neither the fact of advertising's colonization of the horizons of imagination or the pushing of a story about the centrality of goods to human satisfaction should surprise us. The immense collection of goods have to be consumed and even more goods produced. And the story that is used to ensure that is to equate goods with happiness, to equate goods with individual welfare in a very, very concrete and, uh, and, and direct way. So economic growth, in fact, is justified not simply on the basis that it will provide employment, after all, a host of alternative non-productive activities could also provide employment. The central, the central philosophical argument for economic growth is that it will give, economic growth will give us access to more things, and more things will make us happy. That rationale, this rationale for the existing system of ever-increasing production, is told by advertising, I believe, in the most compelling form possible. And in fact, I believe this story, that human satisfaction is intimately connected to the provisions of the market, to economic growth, is the major motivating force for social change as we enter the 21st century. That idea that, that, that human welfare is connected to the growth of the market, I think actually is the major motivating force for social change on a global, not just a national, on a global scale. Now, the question we need to, need to pose at this point, and it's never asked, because if the answer is what it should be, <laughs> then you can't carry on as the way you are. 
The question that's almost never asked is, is this true? Does happiness come from material things? Do we get happier as a society as we get richer, as our standard of living increases, as, as we have more access to the immense collection of commodities, the immense collection of objects? Now, obviously, these are complex issues, and I don't have time to get into all of them, but if I had to give a, if I had to give a, a quick answer to that, the answer I would give is no. Human happiness is not connected to access to more things. It is not connected to it. Now, let me try and justify that. Uh, in a series of surveys conducted in, in the United States starting in 1945 and labeled as the happiness surveys, and they've, they've come right up to the present, um, researchers sought to examine the link between material wealth and subjective happiness. That is, as a society, we have undoubtedly gotten richer. We have access, this generation has access to a higher standard of living in absolute terms than our parents' generation. And the question is, does access to more things make more people happy? And the answer to that, in fact, is no. That when you look at this, when you look at these uh, relationships, both historically and cross-culturally, there is a very weak correlation between happiness and wealth. There is, within, within a society at one time, there is actually, in fact, a correlation. But it, is, it does not bear out over time, and does not bear out across cultures, across nations. And perhaps we can talk more about that in the, in the, in the, in the question period. Now, why should this be so? Why should, why should we not be getting happier as we have access to more things? When we examine this close process more closely, uh, the conclusions appear to be less surprising than perhaps our intuitive perspective might suggest. In another series of surveys called the Quality of Life Surveys, people are asked about the kinds of things that are important to them. What would constitute a good quality of life? And the findings of this research indicate that if the elements of satisfaction were divided into social values, things like love and family and friends, and material values, things like economic security and success, if you, could, if you could divide up the elements of satisfaction in that way, then in fact, social values outrank material values in what people say is important to them. What people say they really want out of life, that is very, you know, very few people, if, if you're asking, what do you want? You know, I want a bigger house, or a BMW, or whatever. Uh, but if you, if you pose them, you know, if you push that further, what is that gonna give you? What you'll get to very quickly is that that's gonna give you access to, to a social life which is what we desire, that, that objects are the way, in, in, in fact, to get to what we really want, which is, uh, which is social connection. What people say they want, this is uh, from these surveys, they want autonomy and control of life, they want meaningful work, they want to feel good about themselves, they want warm family relationships, they want to have real tension-free leisure time, they want close and intimate friends, and they want romance and love. Actually, I believe those are deeply human values. <laughs> I think, that, I think that, that is, those are values that I think actually are part of who we are as, as human beings. That we are, in fact, a social species. And that we desire connection. We desire that, 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 uh, that, that connection. Now, that is not to say the material values are unimportant. Okay? It's not about, well, it's got nothing to do with, of course, material values, of course, are important. They form a necessary but I would argue insufficient component of a good quality of life. And above a certain level of poverty and comfort, that is we have to have a certain level of poverty and comfort, but above a certain level of poverty and comfort, material things simply stop giving us the kind of satisfaction that the magical world of advertising insists they can deliver. These conclusions point to one of the great ironies of the market system. The market is good at providing those things that can be bought and sold, and it has pushed us, via advertising in part, in that direction. That is, it pushes us towards things, because that's what the market system provides, and there's a propaganda effort, propaganda system that shows the way to happiness is goods, goods, goods. It pushes us towards those things. But the real sources of happiness, social relationships, are outside the capability of the marketplace to provide. The marketplace cannot provide love. The marketplace cannot provide real friendships. It cannot provide sociability. 
It can provide other material things and services, but they are not what makes us happy. Now, the advertising industry has known this since at least the 1920s, and in fact, have stopped trying to sell us things based on the material qualities alone. I mean, if you really, really want just goods, they tell us about goods. But they've stopped telling us about the material makeup of goods, what goods do. They stopped doing that about, 100, about, about 90 years ago. In the first period, if we examine the advertising at the end of the 19th century and the first years of the 20th century, we would see, in fact, that advertising did talk a lot about the properties of commodities, what they did, how well they did it, etc., on the assumption that that is what people wanted. But starting in the 1920s, advertising shifts to talking about the relationship of objects to the social life of people. Advertising starts to connect commodities, the things it has to sell, with the powerful images of a deeply desired social life that people say they want. No wonder then that advertising is so attractive to us. No wonder then that advertising is so powerful, so seductive. What it offers us are the images of the real sources of human happiness. Family life, romance and love, sexuality and pleasure friendship and sociability, leisure and relaxation, independence and control of life. If you look at advertising, that's what advertising says you can get. Those are the, and those, are those things, our desire for those things is real. That's why it's so powerful and that's what's real about advertising. The cruel illusion of advertising, however, is the way that it links those qualities to a place that by definition cannot provide it. The market and the immense accumulation of commodities. The falsity then of advertising, and it's, uh, there's a lot of talk about truth and falsity, and I think it's important to figure out what ex when we t talk about truth and falsity, what exactly we're talking about. The falsity of advertising then is not in the appeals it makes, which are very real, appeals to sociability, but in the answers it provides. We want love and friendship and sexuality and meaningful work, and advertising points the way to it through objects. As ex-advertising executive Jerry Goodis puts it, advertising doesn't mirror how people are acting, but how they are dreaming. Not how they're acting, but how they are dreaming. Advertising taps into our real emotions and repackages them, repackages them back, to, back to us, connected to the world of things. What advertising really reflects in that life is the dream life of the culture. In fact, if someone asked me what that, what, what, what's the essential feature of advertising, I would I'd say the way to understand it is the way... Uh, from psychoanalysis, Freud talked about the dream life of the culture. Um, it, it, however, even saying that, even saying that's a dream life, I think simplifies uh, a deeper process because advertisers do more than mirror our dream life. They help to create it. They translate our desires for love, for family, for friendship, for adventure, for sex into our dreams. In that sense, advertising is like a fantasy factory, taking our desire for human social contact reconceiving it, reconceptualizing it, and connecting it with the world of commodities. Now, advertising's role in channeling us in these fruitful, fruitless directions is profound. And in one sense, the other way I would talk about advertising, um, its function is analogous to the drug pusher on the street corner. As we try and break our addiction to things, it is constantly there <laughs> offering us another hit, offering us another whiff. By persistently pushing the idea of the, the good life being connected to products, and by colonizing every nook and cranny of the culture where alternative ideas could be raised. Advertising is an import, important part of the creation of what the economist Tibor Skotovsky calls the joyless economy. That is why aren't we happy despite our access to the kind of wealth that our parents could only dream of. The great political challenge that emerges from this analysis ha is how do we connect our desires? How do we connect our desires to a truly human world, rather than the dead world of the immense collection of commodities. How do we make that reconnection? The third set of stories I want to talk about is stories about the future. The consumer vision that is pushed by advertising and which is conquering the world is based fundamentally, of course, on a notion of economic growth. Uh, growth requires resources, both raw materials and energy, and there is broad consensus among environmental scholars that the Earth cannot sustain past levels of expansion based upon resource-intensive modes of economic activity, especially as more and more nations struggle to join the feeding trough. Now, the, envir the environmental crisis is complex and multi-layered, cutting across both production and consumption issues. But we know 
that if the present growth trends, uh, growth and consumption trends continue unchecked, the limits to growth on this planet will be reached sometime within the next century. Will it be 100 years? Will it be 120 years? Will it be 150? You can, we could argue about how long it can be, but there's no argument that, that, given the way we produce, we will come to a limit. We will come to a limit on how we have organized ourselves. Just in terms of resources, industrial production uses up resources and, and energy at a rate that had never before even been imagined. Since 1950, that is in the last 50 years, we're not talking about ancient history, <laughs> We're talking about history that many of us in this room can actually remember. Just since 1950, the world's population has used more of the Earth's resources than all the generations that came before. In 50 years, in 50 years, we have matched the use of thousands and thousands of years. Now, of course, I want to make, we have to be clear who the we is. And the we is the West and especially North Americans, have used the most of these resources. So we have a special responsibility for the approaching crisis. In another 100, 120, 30 years, we will have exhausted the planet. But even more than that, even more than that, we will have done irreparable damage to the environment on which we depend for everything. The clearest indication of the way in which we produce is having an effect on the ecosphere of the planet is the depletion of the ozone layer which has dramatically increased the amount of ultraviolet radiation that is damaging or lethal to many life forms on the planet. In 1985, scientists discovered the existence of a huge hole in the ozone layer of the South Pole that is the size of the continental United States, illustrating how the activities of humans are changing the very makeup of the Earth. Bill McGibbon, in his book, The End of Nature, reminds us, reminds us that we have done this ourselves by driving our cars, building our factories, cutting down our forests, turning on air conditioners. McGibbon writes that the history of the world is full of the most incredible events that have changed the way we live, but they are all dwarfed by what we have accomplished. And I want to make clear I'm, what we have accomplished. This is a joint responsibility that we have. What we have accomplished in the last 50 years. This is McGibbon, he says, quote, Man's efforts, even at their mightiest, were tiny compared with the size of the planet. The Roman Empire meant nothing to the Arctic or the Amazon. But now, the way of life of one part of the world in one half century is altering every inch and every hour of the globe. And we have done this. Now, it's important to avoid the prediction of immediate catastrophe which sometimes happens with, with this kind of, you know, we're going to, the world is dead tomorrow and there's nothing. But it's important to avoid the prediction of immediate catastrophe. We've already done a lot of damage, but the real environmental crisis will not hit sometime in the middle of the next century. You know, look out on the look at a beautiful day like today. How can we be in the middle of a, an environmental crisis when just look at how beautiful things are? We know that the crisis will hit sometime in the next century. However, to avoid that catastrophe then, we have to take action now. We have, to put in, we have to put in place the steps that will save us in 90, 100, 110 years time. We have to take action now. The metaphor that best describes the task before us, and I, I get this metaphor from, from Bill Lees once again, who has been influential in my thinking here. <laughs> Um, the metaphor that best describes this is of an oil tanker heading for a crash on the shore. Because, now, an oil tanker, because of its momentum and size, if an oil tanker is headed towards the shore, because of its size and momentum, to stop hitting the shore, it has to start turning well before there seems to be any apparent danger. Otherwise, the momentum from the oil tanker will take it into the coast and into the shore and will crash it. If it starts turning too late, it will be too late. <laughs> it will smash into the coast. That is where we are. That is where the consumer society is right now. We have to make fundamental changes in the way we organize ourselves, in what we stress in our economy, if we want to avoid the catastrophe in two generations, three generations' time. We have to take action now. In that sense, the present generation has a unique responsibility in human history. It is literally up to us to save the world to make the changes we need to make 
so that there can be a world in a hundred years' time. If we do not, actually there will be a world in a hundred years' time, you know, I mean, one, just unless we blow ourselves up through nuclear confrontation, there will be a world. Materially, there will be a world, but it will be a world full of barbarism and savagery towards, towards each other. If we, we have to make short-term sacrifices, we especially have to rethink our relationship to the car. You know, it's fun for a while, <laughs> but the car is just choking the life out of the planet. We need to think in, in different ways about transportation. We have to make real changes, not just recycling, yeah, which is nice. But consumer recycling, we know, is a small part until we can get businesses to recycle and really fundamentally alter the way, we're change, well, the way in which we produce. There is, you know, the, 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 it's a band-aid. It's a band-aid in terms of what is actually needed. And we cannot do this individually. You can't go home today and say, oh, I'm going to start really recycling. You can't do it individually. We have to do it collectively. And we have to find the political will somehow to do this. And we may even be dead. In fact, we will most probably be dead when its real effects will be felt. The vital issue is how do we connect? How do we identify with that generation in that next century? As the political philosopher Robert Halbrunner says, quote, there are many who would sacrifice much for their children. Fewer would do so for their grandchildren. But we have to, we have to make that connection across generations now. Forming such bonds will be made even more difficult within our current context that stresses individual, not social needs, and that stresses the immediate situation, not the long-term situation. The advertising system has a time frame, and the time frame of advertising is very, very short term. The advertising system will form the ground on which we think about the future of the human race, and there is nothing in the contemporary world that should give us any hope for the development of a long-term perspective. The time frame of advertising is very short. It encourages us to think about tomorrow, the day after, possibly the next week. <laughs> if you're really lucky, the, the, you know, the, the, the week after that. But there is, the advertising does not have a time frame for, for, for thinking about collective issues in a long-term way. Uh, it does not, in fact, as I, I believe as advertising, um, as more and more advertising impinges on in the culture, as it becomes more and more difficult for individual advertisers to get our attention, and that's where individual advertisers are, are faced with the problem of what they call clutter. As, they, as individual advertisers try and break through the clutter, I think the short-term nature of advertising will become even more intense, as advertising appeals to, our, appeals to our senses rather than to our intellect. It'll appeal to the gut rather than to the head. Uh, it'll appeal to emotions and immediate emotions. The value of a collective social future is one that does not and will not find expression within our commercially dominated culture. Indeed, the prevailing values provide no incentive to provide, to, to develop bonds with future generations. And there is a real sense of nihilism and despair about the future and a sort of closing of ranks against the outside. Now, there, is, there is a cultural effect of, of, of these kinds of values. Many people thought that the environmental crisis would be the linchpin for the lessening of international tensions, as we recognized our interdependence and our collective security and future. Some people thought that, so when the, when the environmental crisis hits, everyone will know we have to do this together. It'll be so obvious that we, we have to take collective action as a society. We can't, well, we know, we know that's not true. We know that's not true from the history. As the Persian Gulf War made clear, I think this is what 9-11 is ultimately about as well, and the response to 9-11 is ultimately about. As the Persian Gulf War made clear, the new world order will be based upon a struggle for scarce resources. George Bush Sr., uh, well, before the propaganda, remember in, in the, um, the, 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 the Gulf War was a very interesting moment to, um, to look at what was at stake, uh, because what George Bush Sr. immediately talked about as to why American troops needed to be in the Gulf, he talked about defending our way of life. You want, you want cheap oil? That's what you've got to have. That's, he said it quite openly. It's about our way of life. Uh, when that wasn't selling very well, when they did, the, when they did the, the, the public opinion polls and found that honesty was not actually going over very well, they, of course, switched to the, um, to the, to the, uh, um, the idea that the Gulf War was about protecting freedom and democracy in Kuwait. Right, like there was freedom and democracy in Kuwait before Saddam Hussein invaded. It's just... It's just I mean, that was, it, was a, it was a public relations ploy, as we know. 
Uh, an automobile culture and a commodity-based culture such as ours is reliant upon sources of cheap oil and about controlling oil and about controlling oil. And even if the United States does not get most of its oil from the, from the Middle East, it knows Europe does and therefore has to control that oil in a, has to control those resources in a very, very close way. If the cost of that is 100,000 dead Iraqis, well, so be it. In such a scenario, the peoples of the third world will be seen as enemies who are making unreasonable claims on our resources. The future and the third world can wait. Our commercial dominated culture, cultural discourse reminds us powerfully every day, we need those resources now. We need our resources and we need them immediately. In that sense, the Gulf War is a preview of what is to come. In fact, I and I firmly believe that um, the Gulf War was deliberately set up by the United States after the Soviet Union collapsed and there needed to be some other rationale for, for this huge military. They had to suck a Saddam Hussein in to invade Kuwait so that they could then make him the bit. I mean, Saddam Hussein is one of the great evil uh, murderers of, of history, we know. He was when the United States supported him before 1990. They, I, they, they suckered him in because they needed. I mean, if, they, if Saddam Hussein didn't exist, they would invent him. If Osama bin Laden didn't exist, they would invent him. In fact, they did invent him. They, they created Osama bin Laden. A military industrial complex relying upon this kind of control requires an enemy. Requires an enemy. As the world runs out of resources, they, it requires an enemy for internal consumption. That's what it requires an enemy for. It doesn't require an enemy for external consumption. It requires an enemy because in a democracy, in a, in a, in a formal democracy, you still have to get consent. You still have to, in Edward Bernays' famous phrase, the public relations, one of the great public relations geniuses, in fact, in, his term, you have to en in, in, in a democracy, you have to engineer consent. That, those are his words. In Walter Lippmann's words, you have to, you have to manufacture consent. That is a requirement of elites in democracies. As the world runs out of resources, the most powerful military sources will use that might to ensure access. What September 11th has done is to highlight this central contradiction between greed and compassion even more starkly, but now with no discussion possible of the effects of our global actions. In the United States, as I said, I bring word from the belly of the beast that there's been unbelievably uh, depressing to live in the United States. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not too sure it's been much better here. <laughs> um, but in the United States, um, there has been almost no dissent possible. Because what happened in the United States was that the Islamic fascists who carried out 9-11 offered up a gift to the homegrown Christian fundamentalists who happened to be running the state in the United States offered up the, big, the, the greatest gift you can possibly give, which is the gift of the suspension of democracy and the silencing of any voices in the mainstream who may want to draw our attention to the dark underbelly of the way of life that we are supposedly defending. If our main export to the Middle East was olive oil and not gasoline oil, there would have been no September the 11th because there wouldn't have been 25,000 American troops in Saudi Arabia. And that's what that's what the Islamic fascist bin Laden is primarily concerned about. If the major export of the Middle East has olive, was olive oil, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting fantasy to have, there would be a just and equitable solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There would be, actually there would not be half a million dead Iraqi children as a result of the inhumane sanctions imposed by the US to keep their own creation, Saddam Hussein, quiet. The bombs being dropped in Afghanistan still, although they're not on the news, there are still bombs being dropped, are there partly for revenge, and it is blind revenge, it's someone has to pay, partly for revenge, but they're there also partly as, as an example to the third world in general to hand over their resources 
or face the consequences, or face the cruel executioner sitting safely high up in the sky, or 10 miles offshore. The United States has perfected a new kind of war, a war without casualties for them. Actually, I think it is, it is, it, you cannot actually have a morally justify war on that basis, because it's, it's war without any of the consequences. But that is where the future, that, that is where we are presently in the United States. You can't, if one American dies, <laughs> that is considered to be too much. And so the only way you can do this is by bombing third world countries without any defense from 10,000 feet up in the air or 10 miles offshore. In fact, there's more American soldiers killed accidentally by, by, you know, by their own fire than there are by, of any chance of dying in action. Actually, I think they should have a new slogan, which is, you know, join the military and live the safest life you can. It's the safest place to be in the US, US Army because they, they've made sure that it's not based on any possibility of the loss of, of American life. And let us be in no doubt, let us be in no doubt, to the extent that we benefit from these actions, to the extent that we benefit from these actions, morally, we are also those executioners. We are also those executioners. Now, getting out of this situation, coming up with new ways to look at the world, will require enormous work. And one response may be just to enjoy the end of the world. <laughs> one, one last great party, the, one last great fling, uh, the party to end all parties. And in fact, I think that's the basis of a lot of nihilism that, that in fact, you know, Gen X is supposed to have, because they don't see a future for themselves. As Frederick Jameson remarks, it is easier for people to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. We have visions for the end of the world and we don't have visions for the end of capitalism. That, that is not because people are stupid or unimaginative, but because the cultural field has given them a limited sense of visions to envision the future. And that is what we have to be involved in. The alternative response to change that situation, to work for humane, collective, long-term values, will require an effort of the most immense kind. Now, I'm going to presume something about the politics in this room, but it may not be true. But uh, I mean, I believe the political challenge of the left in the new millennium is how do we both fight against this system of values and how do we articulate an alternative that draws people in? How do we both fight against it and also articulate a positive vision? Uh, then the I believe the first thing we have to do, and we are now a long way from Dallas's starting point. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if, if Dallas would still be with me on, on this. I hope he would be, because I think what I'm suggesting is based on strategic thinking, not on principal thinking, but on strategic thinking. The first thing we have to do is we have to put culture and symbolism onto the political agenda. Not as a secondary thing, but as a primary thing. We have to struggle over culture and symbolism, the same way we struggle over material resources. Culture, you know, it's, well, we'll deal with culture once we've taken over the factory or whatever. That's the normal thing. There's the real sources where we have conflict, which is around resources, and then we worry about culture later on. I, I, if we do that, we, are, we will be in the same position we are in now, defeated and impotent and marginal to how the society is constructed. We have to start seeing culture as constitutive, not as secondary, not as reflective of economic conditions, but as constitutive of life. Stuart Hall, uh, the British cultural theorist, wrote an article 20 years ago now, more than 20 years ago, called The Culture Gap. And the culture gap is what the left has, in that we don't think about culture properly. His book, Stuart Hall's book, The Hard Road to Renewal, which is a collection of essays on what we have to do, I think, should be required reading on the left. Sort of difficult because it's out of print, <laughs> which is sort of indicative of, of where we are in thinking about these things. The right learned this lesson 30 years ago. You know, what the, right, the right has been involved in the struggle around culture. Corporations have been involved in the struggle around culture from the start of this century. That's what the public relations industry is about. It's about manipulating culture. It's about, and there's no, there is no option other than to fight over culture. There is no option than to fight over storytelling because we are a storytelling species. We have to tell stories. And that, that is what is the creative, the uniquely creative 
dimension of human beings. We are constantly communicating, and we are constantly communicating new things. There is no such thing as neutrality in the, in the field of culture. Culture is automatically connected to power. And the right has recognized this, and, and we have not. And the right has had systematic strategies to deal with culture. And we have not. What did the right do to the 60s? The, look, look at this. I know there's, a, there's an attempt right now to, you know, the 60s were about those crazy hippies in street, you know, in fields, you know, stoned out of their minds. It's lies. Right? When we look at the 60s, you know, the 60s were an unbelievable challenge to, to hegemony, hegemony. You had a student movement that was bo fo focused both on economic justice as well as a move, movement against the war. You have the civil rights movement, which challenges white supremacy and which challenges racism. You have the gay and les lesbian movement, which challenges uh, heterosexual power. You have the women's movement, which challenges, uh, which challenges male supremacy. You have the beginnings of the environmental movement, which encourages us to look at the world in new ways. I mean, this is a major threat to the society. After what seemed to be the, and actually even the, 50, the 50s is sometimes presented as this, as this you know, the decade of tranquility and consensus. It wasn't. It was, a, in fact, a decade of, of deep conflict. And then the 60s came, and there's even more conflict. And what the right did was it said, we're not going to let this happen again. What do we think? Do people think we live in a democracy? And what the right did was to set up what the foundations of the right did. And what businesses did was they set up institutions like the Her in the United States, like the Heritage Foundation here, like the Fraser Institute as one of them, like the Cato Institute in the United States, like the American Enterprise in uh, in Institute. They set up foundations, they set up organizations whose aim it would be to change the way we thought about the world long term. If you look at the Heritage Foundation, and you look at what it was, the, the, its, its, uh, its goal when it was first set up, and they very proudly proclaim it, was to make conservative ideas normal. Well, we are now in a situation where conservative ideas are normal, where welfare is a dirty word, where government is a dirty word. And the right was able to do this because they said, we're going to do this long term. This is not going to be about next week. It's not going to be about the week after. It's not even going to be about next year. We are, we are engaged in a long term struggle over cultural domination. And they set up the institutions to engage in that. Now, the right can do it. The right can do it because they don't care about people uh, starving on street corners. They don't care about... <laughs> Real, they don't care about the inequality of resource allocation. The left does, and, and, and so a lot of our resources have gone into trying to patch the effects of the system within which we live. Well, that is, those will only be band-aids. If we do not pay attention to the cultural struggle over a long-term, in a long-term way, long-term way, we cannot, we cannot have any hope of organizing society in a different way. What Margaret Thatcher did, you know, Margaret Thatcher got you know, working people to vote for her. There wasn't, I mean, you know, on, on the basis of pure economic interest, it should not have been possible. And what, the way Margaret Thatcher did that was not only to speak to people as economic agents, but to speak to people as cultural agents. And she talked to people about identity and about English identity. Now, you can, we can talk all we want about, you can, you know, about the racist aspect of that. But she engaged in the game of identity politics the way it should really be played. Not on an individual basis, not on an individual basis, but on the basis of, of, of political organization. And I'm hopeful that, we, that that was the lesson that Hall says we have to learn. That's the lesson that Stuart Hall says we have to learn. And I'm hopeful that if we learn Hall's lesson, lessons, we can close the culture gap. Why? Why am I... This is, <laughs> you must probably thinking, you must be crazy after all you just said about the, <laughs> the system of advertising and et cetera. Why am I hopeful? Well... What images does capitalism use to sell products? A world of meaningful work. A world of equal opportunity. A world of leisure and relaxation. A world free from racism. A world of sensual pleasure. A world of intense romantic attachments. A world where family relationships matter, where, where friendships matter. It's a world, if you look at the world of advertising on one level, even though it speaks to us as, as individuals, it's a world of caring and connection. Those are the images that it's using. Those are the images of a deeply desired social life. I, the, why, why does advertising use them? I, I think advertising uses them because they are deeply held human values. The values of communalism. 
They've been submerged within the system that we live in. In fact, I would argue those are the images of a different vision of society. That is not capitalism. <laughs> what I've just described is not capitalism. What I've described, in fact, I think will be closer to democratic socialism. And I'm always being encouraged by the fact that capitalism has to use the images and the values of the enemy to try and sell the products it has to sell. And it has to do that, I believe, because I think our values, and I'm okay, making assumptions, I think our values, in fact, are deeply human values. What we, what we have to do, coming back to Hall, what we have to do is we have to re-articulate these images. We have to re-articulate these values in a different direction. Hall talks about articulation. Articulation is about connections. And at the moment, these images, these values, are connected to the market. They're connected to another set of values. And what Hall talks about, this is why we have to put culture at the center of our analysis. What we have to do is we have to disconnect, de-articulate, disarticulate those images with the marketplace and re-articulate them with a different vision of the future. And that work will have to, ha that work can be done because it is cultural work. Because someone, someone has to do it. We have to re-articulate those visions, those images, those values to socialism rather than capitalism, to put it bluntly. For example, how do we think of the idea of the state? How do we think of the idea of the state? What the right has done is to articulate the idea of government against the individual. Right? You've got government, you've got, you got individual interest and you've got government interest. And it's to articulate collective interests against the individuals. So collective ac action, government action, is against individual freedom. That's what the, that, for example, that's what the American dream is about. The American dream is not connected to the state. American dream says, well, it's only when individuals are free in a marketplace to, to struggle by themselves that they can then pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, etc. And so government action is not connected to the American dream. Well, I think what we have to do is we have to start with where we are. And I think one of the major values in America, one of the major stories as told, is the story of the American dream. The American dream, in one sense, is a story about meritocracy. It's a story about equality of opportunity. It's about, yes, we don't all start in the same place, but the playing field is level. Now, if you believe that, if you really believe in meritocracy, if you really believe in meritocracy, what we have to do is we have to connect meritocracy, we have to connect individual freedom to collective action. And to argue and to show how collective action will make individuals free. And it's easy to do. In fact, in, in, in the United States, uh, I mean, I, I, when I speak to my students about this, I, again, it's a little bit different in Canada because I know it's in the process of being dismantled, but you actually do have something called public education here still. Uh, in the United States, there really isn't. And students leave university with about $30,000 in debt. Now, when they leave university with that much amount of debt, they're in no position to be able to think about their futures because they have to start paying back that debt the moment they leave university. So the last thing they're thinking about is, is how to change the world. They're thinking about, how do I pay back this debt? Well, if you were to make public education public, students would leave university and have no debt. And they would be free. They, in fact, would have more individual freedom as a result of collective action. Not less. In fact, the lack of collective action is, is what imprisons individuals. To stress collective action to... In, healthcare is the same. In the United States, because there is no... I mean, it's, it's absurd. There's no system of, of universal healthcare in the United States, and everything is connected to employers. And if you leave your job, you lose healthcare. Well, that is imprisonment. If you had a system of universal healthcare funded through taxes in a centralized way, that means someone who works in Massachusetts could think about moving to California without having to worry about giving up one of the major aspects of, 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 their, of their benefits. Again, collective, collective action, collective action that leads to more individual freedom. That's what we have to engage in. We have to start with where we are. We have to start with the values of the, I mean, I will, I'll start with the values of the American dream, not because I particularly believe them, but I could argue for them you know, as, a, a general, as general meritocracy. But that's where we are. That's where we are. 
And if you want to move where, we're, if you want to be somewhere else, you've got to start with where we are. And you've got to engage in this hard work of this articulation and we articulation on in the cultural sphere and connect the American dream to collective, to collective values. How do we do that? Well, I want to stress four major ways in which we can do that. Firstly, I think we have to make the present images, the present system that surrounds us, we have to make them uninhabitable. Now, these images that we live in, the values that we live in, they're, they're sort of comfortable. They're there, and we sort of put them on like a comfortable coat. <laughs> and no one says, oh, look, you look weird wearing that coat. They, we inhabit them quite naturally. And what we have to do is we have to make the, those values, we have to make them uninhabitable. So that, in fact, we are conscious of what we are doing. We have to destabilize them. We have to show them from what they are. We have to engage in media analysis. We have to engage in media literacy. We have to poke fun at them. We have to make them visible. That, that, I think, is actually the most important thing to do, to make, visible the value, to make visible the symbolic and cultural system within which we live. So it's not just common sense. To put, in fact, common sense on the agenda. Again, when anyone says that's just common sense, right? they, they, they don't want to engage in, in analysis of how, we, how the world is constructed. That's just common sense. It's just always existed. Nonsense. We know that's nonsense. Common sense is always constructed, and we have to, have, we have to, have, we have to do work that points to the fact that the world in which we live is being constructed by someone, and that someone has very specific motivations and ends in mind. My own work, actually, with the Media Education Foundation is partly based on this. It's partly trying to destabilize and partly to, to, to pull back the curtain of, of who are the creators and the authors of, uh, of, of these images that we live in. I mean, partly it's what, in, in, in Vancouver, of course, is what Adbusters does, and there, is, there are more and more organizations doing this. I think, it's, I think it's one of the most, we do have to do that, and education is central to that. Education is central to that. The second thing we have to do is we have to fight for access to the main means of communication for alternative values and stories. We have to fight for a democratic media. I know it's a radical, it's a radical argument to, to have, have a democratic media in a democratic society. In fact, I, I would argue that unless you have a democratic media, you can't have a democratic society. And in the United, in the United States, and I'll keep, I'll, again, I will not talk about things that I, I'm not familiar with, in the United States at least, I mean, we have a media system that has been given over to corporations for use for their own ends. And we have to take that back. We have to take the public airwaves back. And again, I believe, unless, unless, whatever, whatever movement for social change, change, or a movement for social change there are, that if they don't have media reform as a central aspect of their movements, I don't think they are even on the starting block. Now, while the situation may appear hopeless, while it may appear hopeless, we should remind ourselves of how important capitalism deems its monopoly of the means of communication to be, of how important the monopoly of the imagination is. I mean, the campaign, for example, of successive United States government against the Cuban Revolution. And why, why, why has America got this obsession with this small, <laughs> small country in the Caribbean? Well, the, the major reason is you have to smash the good example. That is what Cuba offers. That is what Castro offers, is a different way in which a people can think about their, about their own resources. And it's, the, it's that example that has to be smashed. The obsession of the American national security state with the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua in the 1980s had nothing to do with strategic interest. It had everything to do with showing, with, with showing that, in fact, altern the alternative cannot work. We're destroying, in fact, the good example. Even as the United States government continues to support the most vicious, barbarous, brutal, and murderous regimes around the world, like Saudi Arabia. And so the Saudis will give the Taliban a very, very good run for, I mean, when it comes to authoritarian politics. Right? Just last month, they'd beheaded four people for being gay. Right? Even as the United States supports regimes like that, it takes explicit aims at the, aim at those governments that have tried to redistribute wealth to the most needy, who have prioritized collective values of the values of selfishness and greed. Why do they do that? They do that because the monopoly of the vision is vital. The monopoly, it's not just they have the means to be able to, to articulate these values. They know that they can't be an alternative. They can't be an alternative. The monopoly of the vision is absolutely important. 
Um, and there's I mean, I think it's, there's evidence to be hopeful of, of an attempt to try and change that. Because um, it's important to, although again, the world looks as though it's just, constri you know, this, this, this normal, it just is. The world in which we live is, is the end result of an immense amount of work on the part of capitalism. An immense amount of work on the part of advertising and public relations. It takes enormous effort to hold the world in place as it presently is. The reason consumer ways of looking at the world predominate is because there are billions of dollars being spent on them every single day. The consumer culture is not simply erected and then forgotten. It has to be held in place by the activities of the ad industry and, as I said, increasingly the activities of the invisible public relations industry. Capitalism has to try really hard to convince us about the value of the commercial vision. If, in fact, the commercial vision was, was you know, normal, they wouldn't have to try so hard. If, in fact, you know, we really did become happy through objects, they wouldn't have to try. They wouldn't have to spend what they're doing, every, you know, $200 billion a year to try and convince us, convince us of that. But it's, be, it's precisely because they know those are, not, those are not inherent values that they have to spend, they have to engage in, in this work. In some, in some senses, consumer capitalism is a house of cards, held together in a fragile way by immense effort, and it could just as soon melt away as hold together. It will depend if there are viable alternatives that will motivate people to believe in a different future. If there are other ideas as pleasurable, as powerful, as fun, as passionate with which people can identify. Thirdly, that's the second, we have to fight for access. For a, we have to break the monopoly. We have to break the monopoly. And that monopoly is important. Thirdly, the success of capitalism is only partly connected to its monopolization of the means of communication. It's also connected to the failure of those of us who care about, about alternative visions, um, to create visions, to create images that can compete in any way with the commercial vision. The major alternative offered to date has been a kind of gray and dismal statism. What's the alternative? <laughs> I mean, what's it's, you know, why should we do what we're doing? It's because it's duty. It's, and it's all about you know, fighting against oppression. Well, we have, to, we have to do that. We have to do that. But we also have to articulate a, a positive vision. The imperative task for those of us who want to stress a different set of values is to make the struggle for social change fun and sexy. And by that, I do not mean that we have to use images of sexuality, although we do have to find a way to talk about sexuality. But that we have to find a way of thinking about the struggle against poverty, against homelessness, for health care and child care, to protect the environment. We have to think about that in terms of pleasure and fun and happiness. Not done out of a sense of duty, but done out as a, but engaged in because of pleasure, because it feels good to engage in it. As, as Gloria Steinem says, she says, feminism is what has got out of bed for the last 60 years, in a positive way. In thinking of the task ahead, I'm reminded, I'm going to go back to a feminist book. There's a wonderful book um, about advertising and, and beauty written by a woman called Wendy Chapkiss. The book is called Beauty Secrets, and if, if you haven't read that, I would highly recommend it. Uh, and in, in this book, Wendy Chapkiss um, tells a story about her younger sister. And, she, and her younger sister, she's, who's 12 years old, writes in a diary. Wendy is, this is, is a feminist from you know, the 1970s, from second wave feminism, and her sister is 12 years old. Uh, and she writes in a diary, and, she, and her younger sister really admires, her older sister really admires Wendy, and she writes in a journal, she says, when I grow up, I'm going to be a feminist, just like my sister, except I'm going to dress better. <laughs> Fourth, I believe that progressive intellectuals have a special role to play here. Progressive intellectuals have a special role to play. I again take my lead from Stuart Hall. You've not, you know, I think, I mean, I've stressed Hall a lot, and I think Hall has, has thought about these things in a way that very, very few other theorists have, have done, and has theorized them in a way very few other people have done. Who, Hall argues that organic intellectuals, progressive intellectuals, have two main functions. And now I'm talking about what happens at universities, I'm talking about the specialized function that some of us are engaged in. First, he says he has two broad functions. First, we have to understand our present situation the best it can be understood. We have to turn a cold, objective, 
analytical, analytical gaze onto the world and do the hard intellectual work that is necessary. That is, we have to understand the world the best it can be understood. And dogma will not do here. We have to have an open stance on knowledge. And if we, why do we do that? Because we can't change the world if you don't understand it. And we have, to, we have to go where our research takes us. And universities have a special responsibility here. The only reason I can see for our existence is to ask the hard questions that cannot be asked elsewhere. To ask the questions that cannot be posed elsewhere in society. And to use an overused phrase, to talk truth to power. I know that businesses are trying to take over the university as public funding decreases. I know that. I know that this is not a, a neutral uh, situation I'm talking about. I know that businesses are trying to take over the university and make sure that departments such as communication become places only of technical training, teaching people how to operate cameras and make web pages. Now, I would argue, urge strong, strong resistance to that. And uh, unless we are engaged in, and if, if we're just not engaged in, in job training, you know, what's the point? What's the point of our special, of, of, of having universities? Our only function is in fact to engage in the work and ask the questions that can't be asked elsewhere. Unless we do that, I, I'm not sure how we could justify, justify our existence. Secondly, so no, we, have to, we have to engage in hard work, intellectual work, objective analytical work. And secondly, we have to communicate translate that specialized knowledge for a general audience. Instead of remaining, instead of speaking to about six people as academics normally do, we have to translate that knowledge so that it becomes useful beyond the ivory tower. We have to in fact break down that, that image of the ivory tower. We need the ivory tower to pose those questions and to, to construct new knowledge. But then we have to think about how do we make that knowledge that is created there how do we make it useful for the society as a whole? And my image of, I mean, and I think the teaching function of universities is, is immensely important in this. But also we have to figure out a way to reach beyond. And in my own mind, when I'm thinking about, when I'm thinking about my own teaching and I'm thinking about the videos that, that we're making, uh, in fact, I have a sort of, you know, it's not, I have a sort of target audience in my mind and when I'm teaching. And my, you know, in large lecture format, you know, there's 500 people in a, <laughs> in a room, you know, and there's people at the front, and we have to talk to the people in front, but they're in the front because they're, they're king. Well, I think what we have to do is not only talk to the people at the front, we have to talk to that kid in the back row with the baseball cap who doesn't really want to be there, <laughs> who's there because he's, you know, forced to take some course. Because that is where politics takes place. Talking to people who agree with us is not politics, it's hanging out with your friends. To take the risk of politics, we have to also to take the risk of failure. That is the risk of communication. We have to reach out beyond the ivory tower. Over 100 years ago, Marx observed that there were two directions that capitalism could take. Towards a democratic socialism or towards a brutal barbarism. Those choices were pretty stark then. At the start of the 21st century, I don't think those choices have been starker. Where our future lies will depend on the actions that we, so-called dissidents, intellectuals, and progressives in the developed societies are willing to take. Our actions are key here. Although I frame things in a very different language than he might have used, I hope that as Dallas is looking down on this event and listening to my words, he will recognize the importance of his influence on my starting point of analysis. And I hope he will be agreeing more than he is disagreeing. Thank you.
in my, the, the question is what I want to do is marginalize the right in my wildest dreams, yes. <laughs> yes, I mean, I'd like to marginalize them for the minority views that they hold. For example, let me just, I mean, what the right has done, it's, it's interesting how they've used public opinion. Um, because in fact, I'll go look to the United States. What my colleague, uh, my, actually, he's no longer at UMass, but my friend Justin Lewis just wrote a book on public opinion. And it's interesting, even after you know, 50, you know, 50, 60 years of this propaganda, you know, if we look at where public opinion is, public opinion is unbelievably progressive on a whole host of issues. And what happens in the mainstream media is that what is represented in the mainstream media is the regressive aspects of public opinion. If America, was, if America was organized according to, according to what people really wanted, if you, if you looked at public opinion polls and took them seriously, right, we would have a universal system of healthcare. Has been consistent majority support for healthcare over the last 50 years. We'd have less money spent on the military. We'd have more money spent on education, on the environment. That is, the public itself is, the public itself, in, in broad ways, is, you know, quite is very progressive and what the what the what the media system has to do is hide that progress that that aspect of it and then only highlight the aspects of public opinion that are regret that 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 you know match closely to their own agenda um, I mean what they've done is to marginalize what I think are majority views and what we have to be engaged in is a system is, is a process whereby yeah we are engaged in a, in a battle to marginalize those views now, and again, I know sometimes that the, 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 the metaphor of, or the, the, um, the imagery of, you know, of, con of, of fighting and conquest and, you know, makes some people uneasy, but it's just, we, we, that's, we have to do it. You know, there's always struggle around that. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, for me, it sounds like an extremely daunting task because when you think of the power and the that we have over, over our thought, over our regulatory process, over our communications, over everything, um, and it's tempting to think of ways that might make um, environmentalism, um, our, our social justice system, more attractive to the right and, and in terms of economic benefit. If you could figure that out, I don't know how. I mean, the, the, you know, the, reason they're not connected, the reason they're not committed to social welfare you know, rights is because it costs money and it will cut into private profits. But that will, that will mean re-articulating what the idea of the state is and how it, how it mediates those things. Yes, I, I agree. But firstly, it's to rescue the state. It's to, I mean, not the state, but it's to rescue the idea of government. In fact, it's to rescue the idea of democracy. Sorry, Donald. Yeah. Hi. Um, when you were talking about um, the 30 years ago, the right wing and its, uh, the foundations uh, that established all the think tanks and how successful they have been, and part of the success has to be because the values that they're espousing are the ones that the advertising system are close to what the advertising system uh, is promoting. And if we go back to what Dallas was talking about, the, the free lunch that um, that the foundations are putting into uh, into the news um, wraps around, you know, is wrapped around by the advertising. How could alternative uh, viewpoints break into that, that uh, system? Well, in, it's, I think we, first of all, we have to see that this, there is something up for grabs. And I think at the moment, there, the, the, you know, the public in the United States doesn't even see that there is anything up for grabs. And I think firstly, simply making it visible. Simply making that this is visible. When I tell my students, you know, I mean, when I tell my students about the 1996 Telecommunications Act, you know, I tell a very simple story, which is, you know, what happened in 1996 in the United States was uh, Congress, bought up by the, by the media industry, took $70 billion worth of public resources and gave it away to corporations for nothing. Now, what was engaged in was theft. And in fact, people should be going to prison. Trent Lott should be in prison because he was responsible for that public thing. Now, when you put it in those ways, people are outraged. Right? People are absolutely... When, 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 you, when people find out about these things, students are outraged and said, well, how can this happen? <laughs> so the, the making it visible, I think, is a very, very important part. That's why I think education is so important. Yeah, if, 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 if corporations thought, if, if they thought it didn't matter, they, they'd announce it on the front page. 
we just did this and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. <laughs> right? they, they announce it, but be, it, it, they have to keep it secret. And it's that secrecy, the, it's keeping it secret, that in fact gives me hope. That if, in fact, if when people find out about it, in fact, they, they can put together two and two very, very quickly. So I think the first thing is just making it visible. Making it visible. And I think that will, it, it won't guarantee anything. But it will at least, at least make clear that there is something at stake. The other thing then is to think about, well, how do we do that? That, that, that visibility, that can happen in, it can, either be, it can either happen in the mainstream media, which is very difficult to do right now, because there's no way of breaking it. In fact, then I would, I would urge people to, you know, I think we have to engage in that, in that politics to the extent that we have to, and, you know, try and put out press releases and try and get, you know, a little <laughs> say in there, but it's not going to be systematic. But there are other spaces, I think, other places in the culture in which you can have that kind of debate. Other things that, that may be called civil society, they used to be called civil society, whether they're education, whether community groups, whether they're church organizations, there are other community places where you can have that, that, those discussions. And I think our job is to, is to make sure that we get those discussions into those other places so that at least you can put what is at stake, or you can make visible what is, what is at stake. After that, you know, who, who knows? That's, you know, there's, no, there's no guarantee. But I'm, as I said, one of the things that keeps me going um, is the fact that they have to keep it secret. If they didn't keep it secret, then, right, so why do they have to keep it? But they know, if people know about this stuff, they will lead to popular, you know, p popular backlash. And so I think, you know, we're, we're, we don't have to engage in the fight over resources straight away. We have to engage in the battle. We have to engage in education. And, and, and think about that in a, in a, and I think we have to do it in a creative way. How do we think, how do we, cons how do we, you know, how do we not lecture at people? How do we not just rant at people? But how do we engage people in a debate around these important issues? Um, yeah, if, if they, if, if, the, if, for example, going back to the United States, if, um, you know, if, if the right, if, the, if the, you know, the present system thought there was no opposition to it, why did they try so hard to keep Ralph Nader out of the debates? Right? They knew if you let, let Ralph Nader in, <laughs> he actually would really offer an alternative. And so what had to be shut out was, the, pr was, the, was the, the, the idea that there is any kind of alternative. And you have to limit it to you know, this crazy choice between Tweedledum and Tweedledee, in which you have two business parties. I mean, that's all, that's all I mean, the Democrats and Republicans are, is, is two business parties, and that is what's presented as choice. So again, the, 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 the amount of effort they have to go through to, <laughs> to do that is what gives me, is, gives me hope. Not advertising as it's presently formed in terms of, at the moment, it's just the I mean, it depends what you mean by advertising. Yeah. Can you use those creative ideas, right? It's not, can you use those, can you use creativity in a different dimension? Can you take, it's not, it's not just advertising as this, this is, you know, a 30 second message that, that that's not what advertising, I mean, the way I talk about advertising is as a very motivated form of speech that comes from corporations. And that, and because that's what's dominated advertising. Do I think that you could take creativity, that you could take, instead of that creative talent being used simply in that system, that you could use some of that creative talent and create messages and create communications that have alternative messages? Absolutely. And I think that's what we have to be engaged in. And we have to find places and venues where alternative creativity could be expressed. So, I mean, could it be co-opted? I, mean, I don't think advertising as I've defined it in that way can be co-opted by its very nature. But can you, you know, can you construct, can you do social change in 30 second sound bites? Yes. If you have a different set of values underlying it and if you're smart enough. And I think there's tremendous creativity. I mean, I, the question is how do, we get the, how do we get creativity in the service of something else? That's the major thing that, you know, that, that we have to, and I think, I mean, a lot of people would say, I mean, I, a lot of people on the left have said, well, we can't engage in the, Im the politics of images because it's, all, it's a debased form of, you know, it's a debased form of communication and that, you know, if you're using fast cuts and those things and emotion and it's, you know, you know get over it. This is, you know, we are in, this is the language of the modern age, you know, to think we can only do things rationally, we can only, you know. You know, we are, this is the language of the modern age, and if you want to be, if you want to communicate in the modern age, that is what you've got to do. You've got to be able to, and you won't succeed all the time. You won't succeed. You've got to do it in a really, you know, you've got to think about it in a, in a creative way. But uh, I don't think. So the short answer: I don't think advertising, as I've defined it, can be co-opted. But I think creativity can be put into many different uses, and those formats can be used in in, in other ways. Yeah, I'll come back to this sec in a second.
Interested in the defenses that our opposers put up to um, protect the process and um, as we sit here, tobacco companies are launching a court case, an appeal against the federal government's decision to limit tobacco advertising. And their central argument is that um, it infringes on their freedom of speech. Could you please talk about the relationship between commercial freedom of speech and freedom of speech? Well, it depends if you think corporations have the same, should have the same amount of freedom of speech as individuals. I mean, that's what corporations have, I mean, they've, they've tried to, you know, make that link that, in fact, corporate speech is the same as individual speech. Uh, I don't think that's, I mean, I don't believe that's true. Uh, so I think that's the, f you know, that's the first way to talk about it. Uh, but it's about, you know, it's, it's not just, freedom of, freedom of speech is always, it's never an abstract thing. Freedom of speech in a market society is about who has the most amount of money. And so they're not talking in, a, they may you know, pose this in an abstract way, but what they're, in, in a market system, freedom of speech is one vote, one voice. <laughs> Sorry, one dollar, one voice. And the more dollars you have, the more speech you have. Uh, so I think what we have to do is, if you want to take that seriously, you really believe in free speech? Great. We'll let the tobacco industry have their say. But for every tobacco industry message, there's got to be another one. We believe in diversity. We believe in democracy. We believe in freedom. I think you've got to use that kind of language, not the language of restriction. Not saying, well, you can't do this. If they would let other people do it, I'd be quite happy to engage in it. If they would let other people into the discourse, I'd be quite happy to engage in that. But that, I think that's partly, I mean, they're, they're posing it in, you know, they're posing corporations as individuals. And then what they're really trying to do is, you know, I mean, what they're talking about is not extending free speech, they're talking about restricting free speech. And I think we have to, and once you get into that, no one is for restricting free speech. But we have to use that language ourselves. So let me come back over. Yeah. Um, I was intrigued by the idea you raised about advertising the discourse, the story of individualism, uh, having some causal effect on the whole you know, movement of neoliberalism and the new right. Could you elaborate on that and give us some kind of examples of what you would say would be evidence of advertising's role in that shift? Well, given, given that um, everything takes place in an environment, I mean, I mean all, all thought takes place in an environment. And so what I want to point to is what is the environment that advertising lays out? I mean, it's sort of the groundwork. It's the, it's the, it's the basis on which everything takes place. And to the extent that advertising doesn't talk about those collective issues. You know, there's nowhere in advertising that talks about you know, the, the need for universal health care. But there is lots of talk in advertising, you know, dire I mean, directly talking about privatized healthcare. But even beyond that, even beyond those specific things, to the extent that advertising is really about talking to individuals about their individual desires and is not talking about collective values. I mean, it comes from leaving the alternative out. I, mean, I think that's, that's a very, very powerful way in which power works, is what is not there, not only what is there, but what is not there as well? What can be kept out? What can be silenced? And to the extent that you can silence those other kinds of collective voices, then the voices of neoliberalism operate on, as I said, a very, I don't think it's a direct, you know, it's not this message leads to this. We're talking about it's very fertile ground. In this kind of environment, this kind of thinking will not have much opposition. And again, I don't, as I said, I don't think it's any accident that those two things have gone hand in hand, not directly causally connected but connected as events and environments get connected. So there was a question at the back that you had your hand up? Yeah, I, I've only been here for a few hours at the school. And I, was I thought you remember the talk. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, you can only get the National Post here, and, and that Coke and Shell are sponsors here. Is, is, is it a joke that the university laughs at it, or is it, is it a serious thing that this, this university is pretty much sold out, it seems. Well, that's, I mean, that's how public space gets taken over. Meaning this is, I mean, what corporations are always looking for is, you know, places where they can have exclusive access. And universities are one of those places. Classrooms will be, I mean, this is, this, this at the moment is a, you know, a commercial free space, space. From the viewpoint of, you know, of corporate culture, this is wasted space. And as public funds get cut back, then I'm sure there will be pressure. I mean, that's, 
that the pressure of universities to find other sources is dependent upon where resources come to fund basic activities. And to the extent that public resources and public funding is cut back, then you will look elsewhere. That's why in, in, the, United States, in the United States, the school systems that are the most vulnerable to commercialization, the, the high school and middle school systems that are most vulnerable to commercialization are not the rich ones. Because the rich ones who are well funded don't have to, you know, if they want a new VCR, they can buy one because they're well funded. But if you're, a, if you're in, a, in a, an urban center and you're, you know, if, if, to get a VCR means that you have to bring channel one into your classroom and that's the payoff, well, that's the, that's the trade-off. But it's to do with, you know, it's to do with not individuals at universities being, you know, evil or, you know, but it's to do with, that, that, again, that broader context. You've got to fight for public funding, and if you fight for public funding, then there is less stress and less need to think about alternative ways of funding. Another question just on September 11th. Was September 11th a sacrifice? Like, there's lots of conspiracies going around about Americans letting in the terrorists pull this off. I have no idea, and I wouldn't speculate on that. I do, the only thing I do know, well, there's rumors, you know, but there's rumors. But the, the only thing I do know is, I mean, I, I don't know about, the only thing I do know is how is September 11th being used? And what happened in America, and, and I'm sure in the United States, on September 11th, the world took a giant rightward turn. Right? That, that mean, I, I don't know about, I, I, I don't know about conspiracies, uh, but it's, it's what, what's the, what's the, what, what is the, the, the outcome of September 11th, and there's no doubt the outcome of September 11th is an incredibly reactionary outcome in which, in, in the United States, you know, patriotism is, <laughs> I mean, you can't question. You know, I, I know in, in Canada also, I, I, know, I know there's been, there's also been controversies, you know, locally as well about, about, about free speech. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, would, I would talk less about about conspiracies and theories, and because I, I think we don't have to talk about that to really talk about what is centrally at stake. Possibly, possibly, yeah. <laughs> um, I was watching uh, TSN the other day, the, the sports, the sports station here in Canada. Um, There's a boxing match, and one of the boxers, this is an ad that you might want to use, um, didn't have advertising in the sole of the shoes, but actually on his back. It looked like it was henna. It was actually tattooed on his back, a great big full back advertisement. <laughs> Yep. And the other thing, the other thing there was, uh, was an episode of The Simpsons um, where a church, the church in the local town was l lacking funds, so it, it sold advertising inside the church. And this you know, caused some, some uh, consternation among some of the parishioners, but other people, you know, they loved it. So my question Lisa, Lisa became a Buddhist, didn't she, as a result of it? <laughs> my question is that, do you see any, any limits for this col colonization? Is there a sort of a point where... Um, the colonization is going to spread so far, I know this is just going to be speculation on your part, where people start to click and, you know, the, the sacredness of uh, certain parts of their lives, um, they're going to put their, hand, their hands up and say, you know, go no further kind of thing? I, I wish I could say yes to that. I, I used to think that children's advertising will be that space. I would think that when, I thought that when corporations started to mess with, uh, with you know, with kids, the parents would say, you know, enough. But in fact, they started to mess with kids and, you know, and essentially advertising to children is, I mean, I, I actually can't think of any moral basis on which you should advertise to children. What you're doing when you're advertising to children is you're, you're creating lobbyists for products in the home, right? You're trying to turn kids against their parents. Now, I used to think when, 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 when corporations started to mess with parents and but in fact, it's <laughs> that didn't happen. You know, that, that people, there's been advertising to kids and, and that's partly because of the other, you know, advertise, the te television is seen as a babysitter. In a, you know, especially for, for lower income parents who have, you know, very high stress, uh, high stress lives and, and they can't, you know, they have to, don't have time, for, they don't have the resources for childcare then, then the television in fact acts as a sort of babysitter. You know, my, I think my point is, we should, if television is a babysitter, can it be trusted to be a babysitter? In fact, I would like to, I, I mean, the campaign, I would, the, what, the, one of the ways, if I could talk to parents, I mean, I would talk to them in terms of advertising as a child molester. That's what you're doing. Would you, would you, let, a, would you let a stranger into your house to speak to your kids about turning them against you? Yeah, would you do that? Of course not. But why would you, why'd you place someone in front of a TV for, 
four hours a day when that is precisely what's going on. They're, they're molesting your child the same way that... And, I, and I, some people get upset at me when I start using that kind of language. <laughs> uh, but it, you know, when you start using that language, it actually does get people's attention. And I think it, it poses things in a, in a really... Yeah, you, may have, you may alienate people. That's the risk of politics. That's the, I think that's the risk of politics that we, we, have, we have to take. And again, when will, peop, when will people you know, say no more when we can organize them? When they, well not, not when we can organize them, when they can organize themselves, when there can be some collective kind of, collective kind of opposition to this. Uh, so it's, it's not a question I can ask, answer. Because it's based on what we do. And again, I hope if there's one thing that I, in, in, in the kind of approach that I'm putting forward, uh, I hope if, if there's one thing that comes out of it to you know, the people listening, <laughs> is that the world is always constructed by someone. And there is no such thing as neutrality. And everyone is morally culpable of what's going on in the world. And, and once you know about it, once you become conscious about it, well, you no longer have the excuse of ignorance. And I think part of what we have to do is we have to take the excuse of ignorance <laughs> away from people and really pose it as a moral choice. And at that, at that point, you know, I don't, you know, you can then try and organize around that, but, uh, but we, have to, we have to destroy the myth of innocence. And I think if you can do that, if you can, if you can pose these as, as, you know, deeply moral human choices, then I, I actually have hope. I'm not too sure how quickly. <laughs> I'm not too sure. I mean, I'm, I'm not too sure I'll see social change in my lifetime. But I also know if I don't do what I'm supposed to do now, as I see myself, I have a job. Right? My job is to engage in this kind of work. And if I don't do what I'm supposed to do now, then there'll be no possibility of change 20, 30 years from now. So I, I, I think we have to have, a, lot, we have, to have a, a vision of social change that is also a time frame that is, that is long term as well. And not always talk about you know, the immediate impact. I mean, when, when social change does happen, it seems those happen quickly. You know, when, when the Soviet empire collapsed, in 1989, it didn't collapse overnight. It collapsed because of the incredible the pressures have been put under, you know, since the end of the end of the Second World War. Um, so we have to we have to we have to have a long term long term view of things. Um, we have to let me let me take two more questions and then I'll take one here and then one at the back and then we'll. So. <laughs> Uh -oh, short questions and short answers. So. I hope this is. I hope this will be short. You talk about um, democratic socialism as an alternative, and that it interests me because my understanding of democratic socialism is that it still engages with capitalism. And if it still engages with capitalism, then you're still depleting the Earth's resources. And also, you have to what you're what you're talking about the the, the, the delinking and then the relinking. So what you're saying is you're, you're playing the same game, that social engineering is occurring on the right. We need to do the same. We need to social engineer on the left. And I don't know, that kind of concerns me as well because it gives me the feeling that when people are, where, when there is that social engineering happening, that there is um, there's a, passivi a passivity amongst people that occurs. And, I'm just, and, and I guess I'm just putting forward some of the stuff that's happening in Argentina right now as perhaps alternatives to that where they're completely retracting from like the capitalist system and, and attempting complete, something completely outside of that. Okay, that's two big questions. <laughs> On the first one, to the extent democratic socialism is connected to capitalism, I mean, that's a big question. I mean, my, what I mean by democratic socialism is a system whereby ordinary people have a much more participatory role in the way in which decisions are made. And what will, come, what will be the outcome of that will be dependent upon how those debates take place and what values are expressed within that. And I don't think that's automatically connected to, you know, to, to capitalism. I think they'll be they're talking about some relationship between market forces and other collective forces. And I think there'll always be there. I can't really envision a large scale society where there is not some market system operating. The question is, is, not, is it the only one or what, you know, what's the dominant one? So I think those, those debates are much, you know, very, very complex debates, but I don't think they're automatic. On the second one about, uh, about passivity, uh, there's nothing in what, I hope, in what I've said. I want to organize people. I don't want to make them passive. <laughs> I think the right wants to make them passive. The right wants to make sure they don't think about these things. But, you know, we, we have to engage in that. We have to engage in that battle. Um, and hopefully our values are, are more democratic values than the values of, of the right. The right, I think, wants to engage in it to restrict democracy. 
I want to engage in that battle for democracy. And I think it's a battle, it, and it is, and it's, and, but I, think, I don't think it's one we can ignore. Uh, because someone has to, and I don't call it social engineering, someone has to construct the world. Someone has to define the way the world works. Is, are we going to do that in an, in an authoritarian way? Are we going to do it in a democratic way? What values are going to underpin the, the processes that we use for that? So there was one more. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, say that again, the po politics of... What's your stance on the ethics of image propagation in public and private spaces, such as wheat pasting and image creation, like anti-commercial images? Uh, if you can get away with it, it's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're talking about culture jamming? Yeah, I... But like the ethics versus, like, because you will be infringing on private property at some point. No, it's, it's public property. Right? I mean, the, the question on, on, I mean, for, for television, that, those are public resources. When you see a billboard on the, on the south side of the road, I mean, to the extent that it's private, it's been, it's been made private. It's been stolen. And so the, the, the attempt to take it back is a form of democratic action. Now, you, you are breaking rules, laws, of course. But, you know, that's what, that's what civic action is about. That's about, <laughs> that's about opposition when, things are, when laws are, are unjust. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think there's really an ethics about it. I mean, I don't think it's about what's private and what's... Uh, I mean, you, I wouldn't go into people's homes and, and do this. Right, but a sign on the street, you know, a sign on the street, uh, a billboard on the street. I don't think that's private. I think that is public, and it's been made private, and I think made private in, in an immoral way. And if you can, anything that that highlights that <laughs> and attempts to take it back, and you can get away with it, and not end up in prison, I think I would be all for. Because again, one one of the things that it does, if the, the, one of the things it does, it shows that there is another vision. It shows that what we see is not the only thing that's possible. It shows that what was there before was just a message and someone else has put another message. And it's that alternative, it's that notion that the world is constructed that I think is the most po positive thing about, those, about that kind of culture jamming and about those, that, that reappropriation. It's not, it's not particularly whether the message is done in a particularly good way, but it's this idea that, in fact, action, I mean, that, 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 that space was already taken up by something. And this highlights the way, the way that happened. Okay, we should most probably stop now, so.